do 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 do. All right, I will begin with a word of prayer once I get up here. <clears throat> Dear Father, we thank you again for your many blessings. Help us to glorify you what we do and to understand a little bit more about physics together. In the name of our prayer, Lord Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Uh-oh. It's going to be painful to listen to. Um, let us try number three, maybe. 24.3. Let's take this thing out for a spin, see what it does to us. So here, uh, number, all right, so here's the deal. We've got a parallel plate air capacitor, it says. And Capacitance is 246 picofarads. And we have a charge of 0 0.149 microcoulombs on each plate. And the distance between the plates is 0 0.371 millimeters. <clears throat> so the question is A, find the uh, voltage difference between the plates and B, the area of the capacitor plates, and C, electric field magnitude between the plates. And D, oh my goodness, the surface charge density. All right. Um, so do you know how to do this? By the way, something that's something to watch out for, don't get confused about this, is we use C for capacitance, but we also use it for Coulomb. They don't don't confuse these C's. I mean it's it's unfortunate. But it is what it is. Um, here, I'll tell you this to start with. We've got, so this is 2.4, uh, excuse me, 246 times 10 to the minus 12 farads. And this is 0 0.149 times 10 to the minus 6th coulombs. And this is um, 0 0.371 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. So, like, you know, sometimes multipliers, it's important. I mean, you need to know your multipliers, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the relation between capacitance, charge, and voltage? How do we define it? C was defined to be Q over V, right? So we know C, we know Q, we just need to solve for V. So V is Q over C, which for this problem is 0 0.149 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by um, 2.4, no, not 2, 2.246, right? Actually, is it 246 or is it 2.4? 246. 246 peak times 10 to the minus 12. Whoa, really? That's pretty big, isn't it? So this is 0 0.149 divided by 246 times 10 to the 
10 to the sixth. Um, now the units here are volts because we worked in, um, you know. <clears throat> All right. Um, so what is that? I don't know. Did I, bring my, I hope I brought my calculator. Otherwise, this is going to be painful. Woohoo! I got it. Let's see here. 0.149 divided by 246 times 10 to the power 6. Oh, okay, well, it's pretty big, but not crazy. So we've got 600 and 5.7 volts. So that's the answer to part A. Um, let's see here. Now, I guess I should probably check my answer, right? Um, do, 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 do. All right, so we're in chapter 24, number three, 606. Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, up to, up to the significant figures and so forth. We got, we got it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, how do you figure out the area of the plates? How's that, how's that go? Do you remember the formula we derived? So the formula we derived in class for capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor, what was it? It was C equals to, what was it? It was A epsilon over D. You remember that? And um, technically speaking, we should use epsilon for air, but it's not going to matter. Like, it's so close. It's like less than a percent. So we can pretty much use approximately epsilon, not in this situation. Um, so, all right. Um, so we know the capacitance. We know, well, we know everything here. We can solve for A, right? So this tells me that the area of the plate would be the distance between the plates times the capacitance divided by epsilon naught. So we've got, you know, 0 0.371 times 10 to the minus 3 times my F, times C, which was 246 times 10 to the minus 12, and divided by epsilon naught, which was, I still haven't remember, I haven't memorized epsilon naught yet. It's kind of bad. Usually I have it memorized by now. I'm slipping. It is constant. Oh, come on. What? Shift constant 38. What is going on with my calculator? Oh, my son must have been messing with it. I'm in some kind of weird mode, like complex mode. It was messing it up. Go so shift constant. 38. T again. What? What's T? Oh. It's 32. Epsilon naught's 32 in my calculator. So th this calculator's got, yeah, see, this calculator's got the constants built into it. So I go to here. I do 32. It's got epsilon naught. Oh. Huh. Let's see. That's Which calculator do you have? Oh, yeah. See this, it's got all these constants oh, wow. built in. So it's got like big G, epsilon naught, mass of the neutron, mass of, you know, mass of proton, mass of electron. This could be very helpful for like chemistry. Yeah. So I'm talking about the uh, Casio FX 115, which is my, my calculator of choice. Um, it'll also do um, system of equations. Although I think the interface for yours, that's going to be really nice in here for you. When we set up, set up linear equations, you can just do row reduction to solve them. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. Have you had 221? What that, is that? Uh, linear algebra. Mm -hmm. Is that on your, I don't know if that's on your DCP or not. I, 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 it is for a number of the engineering DCPs, but not all, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, so we have that times 
0.371 times 246 times 10 to the power 15 with a minus oops. All right, if I haven't made a mistake, we've got 0 0.01031 square meters, which if you want to convert to square centimeters, um, see 100 centimeters is equal to a meter, so 100 squared centimeters squared is equal to a meter squared. So if I multiply that by 10,000, I get 103.1 centimeters squared. I th I'm doing that because I, I, so, you know, I, I don't care. Like you could leave the answers in meters squared in my class. It wouldn't bother me. But I'm just doing that because the book, I noticed that the answer in the back of the book was in terms of the centimeter squared. So I just wanted to put it in those terms so I could check my answer. <clears throat> 103.0 centimeters squared. Maybe they got the point .0 because they've used the epsilon for air. Maybe, maybe. So, because um, like epsilon for air, I forget. All right, so then the E field, how do we figure that out? Um, oh, goodness gracious. Um, so to figure out the E field, I don't remember right offhand. I have to work through it. We had that the electric field was equal to sigma over epsilon naught because you have the, um, the plus and the minus q both contributing to the field. So you get half plus a half is one. And then the distance times the electric field is equal to the voltage. So that's d sigma over epsilon naught is equal to the voltage. And so if I want to find uh, well, anyway, the electric field I could just get from this, right? V divided by D. That's the easiest way. Because we, we, know, we know the voltage, we know the distance, so we can find the voltage divided by distance. It gives me a field here because electric field times distance. Since it's a constant electric field, the constant electric field times the distance gives me the voltage change. So, all right, let's do it. We've got um, 605.7 divided by 0. 0.000371 meters. What? No way. Really? Did I do that wrong? Dang, well, that's big. <clears throat> well, all right, I get E equal to uh, 1.633 times 10 to the power 6 um, newtons per coulomb. That's the units for electric field, right? It's pretty big. Oh, it feels big, I don't know. Um, uh, okay, so they've written it as 1,630 kilovolts per meter. So you could also write this as 16, 6, 1,633 kilo um, newtons per coulomb. But another way to write new, newtons per coulomb is... The other way to write newtons per coulomb is um, volts per meter. Right. Do you see why that has to be true? Like, look at this equation. If the units for, remember the electric field is the electric force divided by the charge, right? So if you think about that, the units are newtons per coulomb, but this also reveals that the units for the electric field can be taken to be volts per meter. 
So a volt per meter has to be equal to a newton per coulomb. So kind of worlds colliding there, but um, yeah. Let's see here. Um, and then to figure out the surface charge density, um, what should we do? I guess the easiest thing to do would be to multiply, we could take that top equation. I mean, there's a, about half a dozen different ways we could do it with all the things we've got on the board. But if we do that, we can do sigma is E epsilon naught, right? So we do that number times the epsilon naught. <clears throat> and I get 1.4 um, four, 6 times 10 to the minus 5 cool, um, coulomb per meter squared. which I hope checks with the answer in the back. 14.5 microcoulombs per meter squared. <laughs> yeah, so, so you could also write this as 14.5 microcoulombs per meter squared. I, I, I think it's good for me to talk about some of these things so that when you guys are looking at the book, it's not too mysterious. Like their answer is sometimes not what you might think, you know? But it's usually just a unit conversion away. So is this good? All right, let's go on. I'm moving kind of slow today. All right, I'll try to speed up. Um, all right. Let's talk about 20, 24.5. 24.5, you've got um, a 10.0 microfarad uh, parallel plate capacitor. Um, connected to a 12 volt battery ten microfarad uh, ten volt uh, so the question is what's the charge on each plate part B the question is how much charge would be on the plates if the separation were doubled. If we double, if we double D, keeping everything else the same, I think, while the capacitor remained connected to the battery. If we double D, what was the question? If we double D, oh, how much, how much charge on the plate? Um, assuming we connect it, still it's connected to the battery. Um, and then C, how much charge would be on the plates if the capacitor were connected to a 12 volt battery after the radius of each plate was doubled without changing <laughs> separation? Okay. This is a very silly question. What if we double the radius of the plates. Again, I think the question is how much charge? All right. This is a very silly question. I kind of like it. All right, so move my camera. So how do we find Q for part A? <coughs> What's the formula Q equals to? Mm. Yeah, Q equals to V times C. That's right. So that should be simple enough to do. Q equals to CV, which in this case is 10 microfarads times 12 volts which is 120 um, 
microcoulombs. So 120 microcoulombs. Then the question is if we doubled D, how much Q on the plates? So this is it's a weird way of saying, suppose you put a new capacitor on the same voltage. So the way I would think about it is, um, just to draw a picture, we've still got the same 12 volt battery, but now we're doing a new, a new capacitance. How is the new capacitance related? Well, C nu is A, the epsilon between the plates, which I guess we're thinking is just air. We were not given any other information, so let's just assume it's an air gap, and for lack of imagination, we'll just approximate it by <clears throat> epsilon naught. So that's the formula for parallel plate capacitor, right? But the distance is now, we're doubling in D, right? So it's two times the original D. So if you look at that, that's one half of A epsilon naught over D. But that, you know, is 10 microfarads. So this is 5 microfarads. So all of this together gives us that the charge is 60 microcoulombs. Right? Because when we, for part B, we've still got Q is equal to you know, Q is equal to C nu times 12 volts, right? Which gives me that. <coughs> mm. Likewise, for part C, ooh, goodness gracious. For part C here, we've got, you know, again, I'll draw the same silly picture, 12 volts. We've got a new capacitance, and it's a epsilon naught. Well, it's it's a new <laughs> epsilon naught over d, same d, not twice d now, right? But we're told that the area. Well, it's apparently. I mean, they're telling us a radius, right? So apparently, the plates are disks. By process of, how does this problem make any sense? doubled the radius, right? So we got pi times 2r, where r is the original radius. We doubled it. So that's 4 times pi r squared epsilon naught over d. Now that is, of course, 4 times our original capacitance. So if the original, originally the capacitor has radius r, but we doubled it. We ended up 4 times it. So we have 4 times 10 microfar microfarads. So we've now got a 40 microfarad capacitor, which then tells me that my Q um, is 40 microfarads times 12 volts, which would give me 480 microcoulombs. So for part B, I half it. For part D, I quadruple it. Quadruple it. <clears throat> now I will foolishly check the answer in the back of the book. Let's see what happens. Number five. 120 microcoulombs, 60 microcoulombs, 480 microcoulombs. Yay! We did it. All right. Enough of these. Let me see if I can find one. That is a little bit different here. Um, uh, we could. We could try for number nine. I don't remember these formulas off the top of my head. Like, okay, my parallel plate, this I remember, you know? Yeah. Fine. But the formula for capacitance of a um, coaxial, like a, a cylindrical capacitor, that I have to look up.
All right. You should know the parallel plate one, like. Yeah. But you're allowed to have a formula sheet, so I mean, you get a three by five card. So I would, I would probably put it off there. I said, I <clears throat> words. I would probably put it on there. <coughs> oh, too much, too much. <laughs> um, two point four number nine. So I mean. Um, what more often than not happens on a test like that is I would have you derive it. I would have the pr problem before it probably would be something like show that the, uh, or you know, derive the formula for capacitance um, of a cylindrical capacitor and such and so forth. And, and then the next problem might be to use it or something. I don't know. I mean, we have, I'm not sure it would come up, but. Um, all right, so let's get to it. We've got draw a picture here. And what are we told? Uh, inner, we got minus Q in here. Got plus Q out there, and Q equals to ten picocoulombs. That's puny. Ten ten picocoulombs, and we're told the inner radius is zero point five millimeters. We're told that the outer radius is five millimeters. Five millimeters outer radius. And we're told that the length is 18 centimeters for both of them. That's good, because if they didn't have the same length, I have no idea how to solve this problem, by the way. Um, so A is what's the capacitance, and B, what is the potential difference necessary to produce these charges? All right, so A, find the capacitance, and then B, find the voltage. Now, what's the deal? Remember, the voltage is what? It's um, QC? Is that right? Mm -hmm. So once we find C, we just multiply C by the 10 picocoulombs, and that gives us the voltage. So the main issue is what's the voltage? So I derived them in class, but I'm just going to look them up in the book right now, okay? <clears throat> she might be on the other page here. No? There's usually like a list of nice formulas at the end of the chapter, you know? So. Oh man, well there's the parallel plate. Does it not think it's worthy of the summary? Does it expect us to derive them? I don't want to think right now. Am I going to have to think? Well. Vel, vel, vel. Uh, spherical capacitor. I found the spherical capacitor on page 821. Uh, energy starting capacitors, yeah. Uh -huh. Equivalent capacitance, great. Ooh, what's this back here? Example 24.4, a cylindrical capacitor. Hooray, hooray. This is what we're looking for. So on page 814, it gives you the formula, which we derived in class. Remember, we derived this in class. Um, and the formula for cylindrical capacitance is C is equal to 
2 pi epsilon naught. Now this is for an air gap, approximately speaking. Again, you can replace epsilon naught with the proper epsilon for air if you want a little bit better. But I don't think we have that kind of significant figures going on here, right? So RB over RA is what's in the book. Um, all right. So again, this is from page from page 814, but we worked this out in class, right? Okay. So let's think about it. <clears throat> it must be we're talking about RB is the larger radius, right? Think about it. I mean, you might be like, which one's B? Which one's A? Well, think about it. If the natural log of something is less than 1, it's negative. We can't have negative. So it must be the bigger one. The formula makes sense. And so we've got 2 pi epsilon naught times you know, 18, uh, well, 0 0.18 meters. I always convert everything to meters. Natural log. And, well, I've got millimeters both. So I can do 5 divided by um, 0 0.5. Also known as 10, right? So work that out. See what we get. This problem's not that bad, actually. This problem had me scared at the start. It's kind of like I, I was feeling a little bit, a little bit uh, intimidated by this problem to start with, but I'm starting to feel better about it now. I'm probably getting too proud right now. Bad things are going to happen. Two times pi times epsilon naught times 0.18 divided by yield natural log of 10, and we get ooh. An interesting number. C equal to ah. C equal to four point three four nine, let's say, times ten to the minus twelve um, farads. If I didn't make a miscalculation. Whoa. Yowzers. Well, all right, so. Wait a minute, is this right? C is equal to Q over V, right? So V is equal to Q over C. So don't, don't let me sell you that bill of goods. Right, you got to stop me. Don't let me do this. Right? This is bad. This is bad, bad, bad news right there. <clears throat> I was like, this feels wrong. I'm going to get a pico times a pico, you know? See, this, you could write this as uh, 4.349 picofarads, right? And then the voltage being Q over C is mm, 10 pico coulombs divided by 4.349 picofarads. That just feels right. The picos, they be canceling. And we just do 10 divided by 4.3, whatever that is. And we get 2.3, 2. 2. Uh, 2. basically. 2.30 volts, something like that. I will now foolishly check my answer in the back of the book, as is my custom. Which problem was this? Nine? Yeah. Woohoo! All right, we got it. All right, let's try another one. Let's see here. I want to try to find one that's number. Come on. I'm trying to find an equivalence capacitance one, you know, but a lot of them are even. Oh, I can do that. I, I know how to, I mean, I'm not worried about me being wrong about this. We can do one of the even ones, and I'll leave you guys some of the odd ones to work out by yourself. Right? That'd be smarter. Oh, man. <clears throat> 
All right, so here we go. These questions about like doubling the plate distance or, you know, quadrupling the area, those are kind of interesting questions. They're a little bit trickier than the other ones, aren't they? Because they require this kind of like algebraic approach. You can't just put numbers in. You know, you don't have enough information to just put numbers in. So you have to almost have to adopt an algebraic approach to those, which does make them slightly more challenging in certain regard. All right, where was I? I was okay. I was going to try one of the. I'll, I'll try to do number sixteen here. So this is twenty-four point sixteen. All right. And we've got, here's the deal, 15 picofarads. They call this point A, they call this point B. And then down here, you got nine picofarads and 11 picofarads. And down here is point C. The question is, find the equivalence capacitance between A and B. Oh, between B and C and between A and C. OK, fine. So all right, so I'll do it in steps. This is the same as what? 15 picofarads combined with what? We have capacitors in parallel. They simply add. So this is equivalent to a 20 picofarad. And that is equivalent to a single one with C equivalent equal to 15 times 20 divided by 15 plus 20 um, picofarads. You get a pico squared upstairs and you divide by pico downstairs. So. <clears throat> um, yeah. I get about eight point five seven one picofarads for the uh, equivalent capacitance of this whole network. <laughs> Let's see if I can find another one for us. Uh, tell you what, we'll try to work number 21 next. Oh, okay, so between, between B and this is, so like this is still the point B, yeah. and this is the point C. So between B and C, you've got 20, oh. 20 picofarads, and between A and C, The, that's the equivalent capacitance, so yeah. It's the book's way of trying to say, find the equivalent capacitance in stages. They're trying, to, they're trying to guide you through the stages. First collapse the parallel combination and then series that combination with the other one. It's, it's got to kind of like telescope down. We'll, we'll, let's, try, let's try our hand at number 21 next. Um, before I go erasing stuff, let me move the camera. In the event I never did pan the camera to the other example, it will be not as painful. Hey, hey, hey. This one's got two blue dots, so I wonder what we're up against here, you know? Two blue dots. Kind of scary. But there's no calculus, right? There's no calc in this chapter, is there? <laughs> Don't worry, we'll bring, we'll, we'll find a way to bring calculus back into it. Well, I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find a way, but not right away. I'm joking aside, that will happen again when we get back to the RC circuit. Um, but until then, enjoy the brief respite from calculus. So number uh, 2421. Chapter 24, number 21, we've got this, we've got 7.5 nanofarads 
in parallel with the series combination, you got yourself an 18 nanofarad in series with a 30 nanofarad in series with a 10 nanofarad. All right, that again is in parallel with the 7.5, which is also in parallel with this 6.5 nanofarad. All right, and we go here, point B, and we start over here at point A. And they're telling us that the difference in voltage between VB and VA is maintained to be 25, uh, 25 volts, right? Um, and then we're asked how much charge is stored by the system and well first of all what's the equivalent capacity and second of all how much charge is stored by the system and see how much charge does the 6.5 nano, nanofarad capacitor store and D what's the potential difference across the 7.5 nanofarad capacitor well that's easy I can answer part D without any further for, uh, the answer to part D is what tell me the answer to part D without calculation What's the potential difference across the 7.5 nanofarad capacitor? Well, it's a dumb question because they tell us that the voltage between B and A is 25 volts. Here it is. So the answer to part D had better be 25 volts. Otherwise, that's a typo. Twenty-five volts. Okay, they're just sometimes we throw in an obvious question. You know, it can be that easy. So <laughs> there we go. Answer to D. This is voltage across uh, the seven point five nanofarad capacitor. All right. <clears throat> Let us find the equivalent capacitance. So let me just tell you some um, general guidelines that you should look for as you're calculating. When you have a series of capacitors, when you calculate it, the value should be smaller than the smallest one. Um, same for resistances that are in parallel. A parallel resistance of like three resistors, it should be smaller than the smallest one. Um, but anyway, that's the first thing I'll work out is these three. So we, what we want to do is one, 1 over 18 plus 1 over 30 plus 1 over 10 and invert that um, nanofarads. That will be the um, C equivalent um, for the middle. Uh, middle branch. There's got to be a better name for that. But anyway, so <laughs> what does that work out to? I mean, I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I can't do that in my head, you know? Mm -hmm. So 18 plus 30 plus 10 to the minus 1. And then invert that. I get 90 over 17, but... <laughs> More interestingly, I get um, 5.294 uh, nanofarads. And just as a check on my calculation, is that smaller than all three of these? It is. That's a good, just a check. And then, so, C equivalent in total is simply 7.5 nanofarads plus this 5.294 nanofarads plus my 6.5 nanofarads. Does that make sense? Okay. Because those are in parallel, so I just add those. It's easier. And I get uh, 19.294 it's probably too many digits, but anyway, 19.294 nanofarads. 
There's my equivalent capacitance. There's my answer to part A, I think. Part B was what was the total charge stored. And so I think what's meant by that, I mean, man, I see, it depends on how they're... So there's a stupid answer to that question, which is zero, because there's minus Q and Q on each side of the plates. I hope that's not what they're trying to ask. Because the thing I'd like to say is that the charge stored, we talk about you know the magnitude of the, the charge stored in terms of the equivalent capacitance. I think that's what we worked out was like, <clears throat> excuse me, I keep forgetting the formula. Um, my bad. Good grief. Just a second. Let me find a marker. All right, so. C is defined to be Q over V, right? So Q is equal to CV. And. So, um, we take the 19.294 nanofarads times my 25.0 volts. That should tell me the total charge. I mean, that's the charge which is interesting if we want to calculate the energy stored in the capacitor which I know I'm going to talk more about for, I'm going to talk about that in class Monday, but I'll talk to you about it now in a second. We're going to get to a problem with energy, I'm sure. Yeah, so this is 482.25 nanocoulombs, I think is the answer they're looking for. Let's 36.5? Oh no, what have I done? Which problem are we on? 21. Well, part B said 482 nanocoulombs. Oh, I was reading C. Oh, okay. Well, C, okay, C is a different question though, right? So C is, what was C? So that is right for, for, for part B. And then for part C, the question was, how much charge on the 6.5 nanofarad? So for the 6.5, so this is equivalent, this is the total one. For on the 6.5, the charge on the 6.5, it would be 6.5 nanofarads times your 25, 20, why, why 25 volts? Because there is 25 volts from here to here. They haven't asked us the more interesting question, which is like, um, it's kind of funny, but he's like, how much charge is on this plate, you know? But they didn't ask us that, oh well. Um, <clears throat> um, so whatever that is, I guess I could do that in my head. That's a hundred and, oh wait a minute, 25. Let me not try to do that in my head. One sixty-two point five nanocoulombs. That was the answer to part C. And D we answered at the start because it was dumb. All right, great. Let us go on. Um, let's see here. <coughs> Oh, um, yowzers. All right, I'm going to erase this here. I can find my. Whew, goodness gracious. All right, 
Let's see here. Um, well, I'll eventually get to it. <clears throat> oh man, how many pages do I have to flip here? Quite a few. All right, finally. Let me find another good example. All right, let's let's look at number twenty-eight. Uh, 24, 20, number 28. So here we are given, here's point, point A, capacitor, another capacitor, point B. All right, 150 nanofarads, 120 nanofarads, right? And we're told that the voltage between B and A is 48 volts, okay? And we're supposed to find the total charge stored in the network. Find the total charge, B, charge on each capacitor. <laughs> that's a funny, that's a funny question. <laughs> each, each capacitor. <laughs> ah, you funny book. Um, C, total energy stored in the network. And E, oh wait a minute, where's D? Energy stored in each capacitor. And then E, the voltage across each. All right. Move the camera back before I forget. <clears throat> All right. Let's do it. So to answer part A, what do we want to do? We find the equivalent capacitance, right? So this is equivalent to one capacitor we do 150 times 120 and we divide by the sum I like this formula for two ones, you know. I don't try to I don't try to know I don't try to remember formula for three. For three or more I just add reciprocals and reciprocate. But for two this is a nice formula. You know? So whatever that is. Um, 66 .6, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, 66, And that actually works out to um, 3,200 nano coulombs. Also written more nicely as 3.200 micro coulombs. Right. Oh, wait a minute. This is a... Uh, this is an even problem, isn't it? So we're, we're going to have to trust me. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's fine. And um, so that's the total charge. 
B is a funny question because remember our discussion about capacitors in series? Yeah, it's the same, right? It's like our picture is like, you've got Q here, you've got minus Q here. Well, you've got Q here, you've got minus Q here. So it's like, there's Q on this one, there's Q on that one. I mean, it's the same charge. So the answer to our part C is like, uh, part B is like, this is the answer to A and B. That's why I was laughing. Now the energy stored, that's, <clears throat> that's something new. Um, so, um, let's see here. How can I explain this? Um, so D, D, V, no, my bad. The potential energy per unit charge. DU, DQ, this is voltage. Now we usually talk about it like, um, I mean to be, more, to be more honest though, that's actually DV. So the little bit of change in voltage, I think about the little bit of um, potential energy that it takes to add, you know, potential energy added like that. Is that right? Oh, I'm a dummy. I'm a dummy. Not DV. I'm, I'm stupid. I'm sorry. Um, so, all right. So then DU is VDQ. But what was, how does the, uh, what's the formula for capacitance? What's the capa how's capacitance defined? Capacitance is equal to Q over V. Is that right? So, um, V is also what? V is Q over C, right? So I can write this as Q over C dQ. So if I integrate this, what do I get? I get U the potential energy stored on a capacitor is equal to Q squared divided by 2C. So that's the energy stored in the capacitor. And much like we discovered there's three formulas for power today, there are also three formulas for the energy stored on a capacitor. Like, I can write it that way, but I can also solve for, you know, Q is equal to CV, right? So I can also write this as like CV quantity squared divided by 2C, which will give me V squared, CV squared over 2, I think. The C is not squared anymore. Maybe that's just it. Maybe that's it's just two formulas. Maybe I remember wrong. I guess it's just that. Yeah. Since I'm not well, let me check the book for a second. Yes, U is Q squared over 2C, which is equal to um, 1 half CV squared. I got that one. Oh, we could also write it in terms of just Q and V. How would this look at in terms of if I wanted to keep... Um, a Q and a V. How could I rewrite this formula? So suppose I take, this is um, CV times V, right? But CV is Q. So this is also one half QV. I was right, there's three formulas. So you can either write the energy stored as one half QV. You can write the energy stored as one half um, CV squared or the energy stored in the capacitor is Q squared over 2C. <clears throat> now you might wonder where is the energy stored? And the answer to that is in the electric field. Now, so how much energy, what's the total energy stored? 